Hello there, I'm Gary Sims from Android Authority and there have been lots of exciting announcements from ARM this week. We've got more details on its new SoC architecture called Dynamic. We've got details about the new high performance core, the Cortex A75. We also have learned more about the new power efficiency core, the Cortex A55. And then of course there's the new GPU, the Mali G72. So my plan is that this week I'm gonna do four different videos for you. They're gonna be short and to the point and each one is gonna concentrate on each of these four announcements. So the first video today is gonna to be about Dynamic. So the question before us is this, what is Dynamic and how will it affect SOC design in the future? Well, let me explain. So first let's start with a bit of history. Now one of the biggest changes we've seen in mobile uh, processors over the last recent years is the use of heterogeneous multiprocessing. Now that means that in a heterogeneous environment, not all of the cores inside the processor are the same. Now typically nowadays in an octa-core processor, there would be four high performance cores, let's say a Cortex A73 or a Cortex A72, and then there would be four power efficient cores, let's say the Cortex A53. Now these groups of cores were put into different clusters. So you had a cluster of four high performance cores and then a separate cluster of four energy efficient cores. And originally the design worked that you could actually just switch between them. So it was either running four of one type or four of the other type. And that's actually what uh, Apple do in the A10 Fusion today. But on the uh, other processors from Samsung and Qualcomm and Huawei, things have developed quite significantly. We're now in a stage where you can run all eight cores or six cores simultaneously and the or all of them are being used at the same time and jobs are moved from one core to the other according to the energy uh, requirements needed. Now the problem with this design is these clusters are quite independent. So for example, across a cluster you might have a level two cache and across the other cluster you might have a level two cache, but they didn't share a cache. And so therefore the interconnect had to be really clever to make sure that the information in the caches was kind of spread amongst both sets of clusters. And, and basically because they were kind of semi-autonomous, when it, that created barriers, whenever there's a barrier between something that reduces performance. And so ARM have been thinking now for about three years, how could you make a SOC where there were different types of cores, but inside the same cluster, which means they could share a lot of the same resources, they could share the same cache, it would make the interconnect less complicated, and of course it would increase performance. And that's what Dynamic is. They've come up with a solution that allows SOC manufacturers to produce anything up to an octa-core processor, mixing and matching different types of high performance and energy efficient cores inside one cluster. Now the ramifications of this are really quite significant. First of all, it's now much easier for an SOC maker to produce an octa-core processor. Before they had to have the two clusters, the complicated interconnect, but now inside one cluster, you can just pick and match which of the cores you want to put into that cluster. And in fact, ARM say there are now up to 3000 different configurations that you can make inside a processor using uh, Dynamic. And that of course includes what cores to use, but also what levels of caching to use, what components to include in terms of floating point and neon and all that inside of the different cores. So there really is a whole bunch of different configurations. That's great for us as consumers because it means actually there will be a whole bunch of different differentiating types of CPU. So if maybe one company, let's say Qualcomm, want to go in one direction, maybe uh, Huawei wants to go in another direction, maybe Samsung will take it in another direction, there are just so many different ways and each company will have its unique proposition about why its processor design is maybe better, which processor configuration is better than a different one. Now, up until now, when we've really seen uh, HMP processors, they've really been two plus four or four plus four. So all of the current flagship uh, SOCs are using four high-end cores, that's Cortex A73, for example, and then four power efficient cores, let's say the Cortex A53. And we've had some hexa-core processors before where there were two high uh, performance cores and four power efficiency cores. But now, in, with this new system in Dynamic, we can see that whole thing mixed up. For example, you might see a four and a one or you might see a three and a one, or you might see a seven and a one. I mean, the combinations are anything you like inside of that one cluster up to eight processor cores. Now, why is that important? It means 
that uh, SOC makers, particularly those that are making for the mid and low range, can now mix and match much easier yeah? what types of cores they want to put inside their processors. And because it's all about silicon size, when it comes to pricing and it comes to profit, it's all about how much silicon is used inside of each of these processors. Now, maybe a mid-range processor might just have one high performance core, which will give us great single-threaded performance, great scores on Geekbench on the single-threaded uh, performance, and a great score uh, user experience because some types of tasks really do heavily use one single core, but then there would still be four power efficiency cores for all of those other light work that needs to go on. And yet that would be maybe less silicon size than maybe an octa-core processor that was just using Cortex-A53 across the board. So that actually means we can see quite a lot of differentiation occurring now in the mid-range. Now I'm pretty sure that at the high end we're still going to see 4 plus 4 as the norm, but there is room for experimentation. Maybe we'll see 5 plus 3 or maybe we'll see 6 plus 2. I mean, these processor makers now can really start to think about different combinations they want to make and see what comes out best in terms of performance and in terms of energy efficiency. And we might see quite some diverse different solutions coming from the big SOC makers. And the other big difference is for the first time now, in an ARM mobile-based processor, we have L3 cache. And if you don't know what L3 cache is, I really recommend you go and watch my video, What is Cache Memory? Gary explains. And there you'll see all about L1, L2, and L3 cache. Now, up until now, the L2 cache has been shared across the cluster. The L1 cache was on a per CPU core basis, and there was no L3 cache. Now with Dynamic, you've got an L1 cache that is per CPU core, an L2 cache, which is per CPU core, and then an L3 cache, which is across the entire cluster. Now, if you're thinking that would actually raise the uh, silicon cost, because now you've got to have an L1, L2, and L3 cache, it actually turns out that actually the L1 and the L2 cache are going to be much smaller than they were before, because now the L3 cache is up to four megabytes. Now, in implementing this L3 cache, ARM have done a really clever thing. You're, the SOC maker is allowed to partition the cache into different sections. And that's good for two reasons. One is it stops what they call cache thrashing, where one particular part of the SOC is dominating the cache because it's shared across all of the CPU cores. But also, because of this partitioning, they can shut down parts of the cache and therefore save power. So when a particular core powers down, if it's the only core using a particular part of the cache, then that part of the cache can power down. In fact, there are even scenarios where you might not even power up the cache for certain operations, only later on you might power it up when you, when you need it. And actually that's all controlled in the software. And one last thing worth mentioning, because all the CPU cores are now inside of the same cluster, powering down those CPU cores so they are switched off and therefore not using any uh, power, not draining your battery at all, is much easier than it was before. In fact, the number of steps required internally to do that has been halved. And before, it was mainly handled by the software inside of, let's say, the Linux kernel. But now, actually, it's all handled in hardware, which means, of course, it is super efficient. So what does this mean for us as consumers? Well, I think in 2018, we're going to see phones using processors based on the dynamic architecture. And I think we're gonna see them from Qualcomm and Samsung and Huawei and from MediaTek. Now, how they choose to do that, of course, we don't yet know. I have a feeling that certainly in the mid range, we're gonna see Qualcomm processors using dynamic. We're certainly gonna see um, processors from MediaTek using dynamic. Uh, maybe at Qualcomm will continue with their Cryo series using the built-on Cortex uh, license. So they'll take this dynamic, they'll take the A75, they'll take the A55, and they will modify it to make a custom, semi-custom uh, processor. It's unknown what Samsung are going to do because they've got the M1 and the M2 cores, and I don't know how they're going to be able to integrate that with Dynamic. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do in the future. And I think Huawei are going to basically do what they've done for their last current generation. They're going to take four Cortex-A75 cores and four Cortex-A55 cores, and they're going to put them into a big, beefy uh, Kirin processor with a Mali G72 uh, GPU. This is my speculation. We'll see what happens. 
So to recap, Dynamic is a new way of building uh, mobile processors based on the ARM architecture. It's coming in the, with the Cortex A75, it's coming with the Cortex A55, which will be my next videos. It brings all of these cores up to an optical into one cluster. You've now got a level three cache, which boosts performance and, and makes it more energy efficient. And of course, those are the things that we want. I'm Gary Sims from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. There are three more videos coming in this series, so please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hit that bell icon so that you get a notification when we publish these new videos. And last but not least, do go over to androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android.